profit to motivate private industry. If we humans ever go to those worlds, then it will be because a nation or a consortium of them believes it to be to its advantage or to the advantage of the human species. Just now, there are a great many matters that are pressing in on us that compete for the money it takes to send people to other worlds. Should we solve those problems first? Or are they a reason for going? makers knew we're children equally of the earth and the sky. In our tenure on this planet, we've accumulated dangerous evolutionary baggage, propensities for aggression and ritual, submission to leaders, hostility to outsiders, all of which puts our survival in some doubt. But we've also acquired compassion for others, love for our children, a desire to learn from history and experience, and a great soaring passionate intelligence, the clear tools for our continued survival and prosperity. Which aspects of our nature will prevail is uncertain, particularly when our visions and prospects are bound to one small part of the small planet Earth. But up there in the cosmos, an inescapable perspective awaits. National boundaries are not evident when we view the Earth from space. Fanatic ethnic or religious or national identifications are a little difficult to support when we see our planet as a fragile blue crescent fading to become an inconspicuous point of light against the bastion and citadel of the stars. The spacecraft was a long way from home, speeding away from the sun at 40,000 miles an hour. But in early February of 1990, it was overtaken by an urgent message from Earth. 
Obediently, it turned its cameras back toward the now distant planets, slewing its scan platform from one spot in the sky to another. It snapped 60 pictures and stored them in digital form on its tape recorder. Then slowly, in March, April, and May, it radioed the data back to Earth. Each image was composed of 640,000 pixels. The spacecraft was 3.7 billion miles away from Earth, so far away that it took each pixel five and a half hours, traveling at the speed of light, to reach us. The pictures might have been returned earlier, but the big radio telescopes in California, Spain, and Australia that receive these whispers from the edge of the solar system had responsibilities to other ships that ply the sea of space, among them Magellan, bound for Venus, and Galileo on its tortuous passage to Jupiter. Voyager 1 was so high above the ecliptic plane because, in 1981, it had made a close pass by Titan, the giant moon of Saturn. Its sister ship, Voyager 2, was dispatched on a different trajectory within the ecliptic plane. And so she was able to perform her celebrated explorations of Uranus and Neptune. The two Voyager robots have explored four planets and nearly 60 moons. They are triumphs of human engineering and one of the glories of the American space program. They will be in the history books when much else about our time is forgotten. The Voyagers were guaranteed to work only until the Saturn encounter. I thought it might be a good idea, just after Saturn, to have them take one last glance homeward. From Saturn, I knew, the Earth would appear too small for Voyager to make out any detail. Our planet would be just a point of light, a lonely pixel, hardly distinguishable from the many other points of light Voyager would see, nearby planets, far off suns. Mariners had painstakingly mapped the coastlines of continents. Geographers had translated these findings into charts and globes. Photographs of tiny patches of the Earth had been obtained first by balloons and aircraft, then by rockets in brief ballistic flight, and at last by orbiting spacecraft, giving a perspective like the one you achieve by positioning your eyeball about an inch above a large globe. While almost everyone is taught that the Earth is a sphere, with all of us somehow glued to it by gravity, the reality of our circumstance did not really begin to sink in until the famous frame-filling Apollo photograph of the whole Earth, the one taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts on the last journey of humans to the moon. It has become a kind of icon of our age. There's Antarctica at what? Americans and Europeans so readily regard as the bottom. And then all of Africa stretching up above it. You can see Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Kenya, where the earliest humans lived. At top right are Saudi Arabia and what Europeans call the Near East. Just barely peeking out at the top is the Mediterranean Sea, around which so much of our global civilization emerged. You can 